Okay. Thank you. Okay, let me get situated here. All right. First off, I wanna thank all of the press for showing up today again. Like last week, we really appreciate your interest in your um, work on the subject and getting the message out to people about what's happening in Montana. As you know, last week, there is a significant action taken by uh, the Budget Committee on Health and Human Services, and that was to cut the Health and Human Services budget by a billion dollars, so take a billion dollars out of the economy, cut jobs, and cut health care for people at a time when we have a pandemic, and it made no sense. And so today, what we're going to be talking about is our clear alternative to the action of the Republicans, and that is comprehensive health care, job creation, and uh, lowering the cost of care for Montanans. So the first thing we'll talk about is a bill that I have in the hopper. It is uh, LC 1337. And what LC 1337 does is it builds off the success of HealthLink. As you know, in 2015, when we passed Medicaid expansion, there was a key component. Win-win, healthcare for Montanans as uninsured, for Mon healthcare for Montanans, as well as a job training and education program called HealthLink. It's been successful. And so what my LC does pretty soon will be a bill is to build off of the success of HealthLink and to fine tune it to meet the needs of the current uh, workforce and the economy. And how is that? By uh, focusing on healthcare jobs. As you know, during the pandemic, there's been huge workforce shortages. And so what this bill will focus on is, like I said, specific needs of the pandemic and our economy by providing training and education for career ladders, beginning with CNAs, we have a shortage of uh, certified nurses assistants. We have a shortage of nurses. And so what the health link, my program will do is work on jobs, jobs, jobs paired with healthcare. It's a win-win. Medicaid expansion has provided a healthier Montana and now they need to go to work and they want to go to work. And so that's what my job does. And with that, my job, all I can think about is jobs right now, jobs and healthcare, just like the rest of my colleagues. And so now I'll turn it over to Senator Shane Marchot to talk about price transparency. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Mary. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, all right, great. Well, my name's Shane Morjo, Senator Shane Morjo. And uh, this session, I'll be bringing a bill. Um, right now it's LC 1163. That's gonna address transparency to bring down costs and, and put more money back in the pockets of Montanans. And, as we all know, healthcare costs continue to rise in Montana. Uh, Montana families are they're regularly faced with tough decisions. And those decisions are about how to balance expensive medical bills with their regular expenses, such as rent, groceries, and transportation costs. And many Montanans, I believe, um, especially through my campaign this last year, um, I believe have lost trust in the healthcare system. And they've been caught off guard when they, when they get their medical bills in the mail when they go to the doctor and it's oftentimes it's too late to remedy it. So I wanna change that. And my bill would require medical providers to be more transparent with patients up front, not when a patient asks to see costs, but to provide it right out the gate to ensure they know what the costs are gonna be for non-emergency services before they begin their treatment. So when a Montanan walks into their doctor's office and receives a treatment plan, this bill would require the provider to include a cost breakdown so that the patients are more informed about their care and they don't find themselves unexpectedly burdened by their medical bills. So for example, if I visit my, my doctor and um, I'm recommended a knee surgery, I would be provided with a document listing out the services I'll need and the cost for those services um, to show me how much that's going to, going to end up costing me. Um, really, my goal of this bill is to make sure patients have all of the information they need to make the best, most informed decision about their care. And it's specific to non-emergency services to ensure that our providers don't experience barriers when we're working to provide immediate and life-saving care. Um, I think that this ultimate result in the long-term um, and short-term will be lower insurance premiums over time. Uh, when people are more informed about the decisions um, that they're provided uh, to patients, 
Um, they have the opportunity to avoid unnecessary costs, and I think that results in lower premiums over time for, for uh, ratepayers. So I'd be happy to take any questions at the end, um, but before I do that, I want to turn things over to Representative Karjala to talk about what she's bringing to keep insulin costs in check. Thanks, Senator Mergeau. 64,000 Montana adults currently have diagnosed diabetes. That's a number that has risen from 2.9% of Montanans in 1990 to 6.4% in 2019. As anyone who has a family member or friend with diabetes knows, diabetes is expensive. People with diabetes have medical expenses more than twice as high than those who do not have diabetes. A big part of those costs is insulin. Insulin is used to regulate one's blood sugar and for millions of people, access to insulin is literally a matter of life and death, not to mention a matter of being able to remain in the workforce. It's also expensive often to the point where people are forced to go without it. In fact, one in four insulin users said cost impacted their insulin use. LC 1492 aims to make insulin more affordable for Montanans who depend on it by capping insulin costs at $35, regardless of the amount of or type of insulin needed to fill that person's prescription. So for example, under our current system, a patient has a high deductible plan and needs four vials of a rapid acting insulin and three vials of long acting insulin per month and typically pays $2,100 that seven vials at $300 per month. If this bill is enacted, their payment would be limited to $35 a month. That's putting more than $2,000 back in the pockets of Montanans. Similar legislation is passed in Colorado and has had neg negligible impacts on premiums while making insulin more affordable for thousands. We can do the same here in Montana with LC 1492. We can keep Montana workers healthy and employed and make insulin more affordable with all, for all. With that, I'm sure we'd all be happy to answer any questions you have. Well, um, thank you, representatives and uh, Senator. Um, as we jump into questions, um, if folks want to use the raise hand feature on Zoom, that can now be found um, in the reactions here. I'm seeing Denison first, uh, first on the draw there. Um, so let's go uh, Mike and then Eric. And if folks want to just um, say their name and out what they represent and then direct their questions towards um, a specific member, that would be great. Uh, so Mike, go ahead. I have a general question for any of the um, lawmakers. Um, given that you're in a substantial minority and we have a Republican governor and uh, in s at least one of these things I've seen him or fellow Republicans talking about, are Democratic sponsored sponsored propos proposals pretty much uh, going to be assigned to the wastebasket rather than uh, getting any traction in this political environment? I can talk on that, Mike. You always you always have the best questions, <laughs> um, but you know I think we owe a duty to our constituents, to Montanans, to to continue to try to do everything we can to ensure that they have affordable health care and access to health care. Um, you know, we need to do everything we can to make sure people are, we're creating jobs and our perspectives matter. And, you know, we represent a major portion of the state and I would hope that our, our colleagues across the aisle would uh, recognize that and recognize the fact that um, their, their voices are, are just as important as everyone else's. So, you know, all of these bills, um, they, they cost little or nothing to the taxpayer. They help our economy um, and they lower costs for Montanans. And we're optimistic that the um, our folks on the other side of the aisle will find uh, support for these uh, efforts as well. I'd like to add to that, that I've been in the minority most of my legislative career beginning in 2004. And so, um, and then remind everyone that Medicaid expansion, the first time it passed and second time it passed, with the jobs component um, was passed with bipartisan support and things are tough, but they're not that tough. It's not gonna stop me. We're gonna get stuff done, believe me. Um, uh, Eric. Yeah, so kind of building on that last question, this is for Representative Kifaro. Is there a fiscal note attached to your, your, the bill you're proposing? 
And if so, how much is it? If, if not, what, how are you wanting to work on that without providing additional funding? Um, thank you, Eric. There is no cost to this bill, doesn't cost any money. And the reason it doesn't cost any money is because HelpLink is already funded. This isn't a matter of spending more money. It, we can do exactly what we're doing now with the same amount of money. The difference is, is that it will have a specific focus on jobs that the economy currently needs, people who need the jobs and jobs that are needed in the economy that are focused around healthcare. There's a huge shortage of um, healthcare workers top to bottom. And so that's what the bill does. Doesn't cost anything more. Um, Eric, still seeing a hand. Did you have a follow up? Or, oh, oh no, you, uh, oh, you'd be here. Oh, you'd be here in about it if I had a follow up. <laughs> okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, Shaylee, then Iris, then Jackie. Uh, yeah, thanks. I appreciate you guys um, holding this presser. I uh, have a question for Representative Cafaro as well about uh, the starting point motion in Section B. So I just, I, I'm curious, given that that starting point motion doesn't square with Governor elect or Governor Gianforte's proposed budget. I'm curious if that gives you optimism, if that, I mean, what do you make of that, the, 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 the difference there? What I know is that the Republicans on our committee, the legislators decided to take a billion dollars out of the economy, cut jobs, um, further harm businesses and really deplete health care. And so that's what I know. The interaction between the governor's budget and the Republicans, I can't speak to. I'm not a Republican and I don't work for the governor. I work for the people of Montana. Cool. Um, Iris, Jackie, then Daryl. Hi, thanks for holding this availability. And I'm with the Associate Press for those of you that I haven't interacted with before. Um, my question is building on Mike's earlier question. I'm wondering if you've had any preliminary discussions with your Republican colleagues and what those discussions have looked like so far. I can take that. Iris, I've been speaking to my colleagues across the aisle about the bill. They've been pretty enthusiastic. I've sent them bill draft copies, and um, they've had some concerns about coverage for the state plan, which I excluded intentionally so that there would not be a fiscal note, if much of a fiscal note. And um, I've also contacted the governor's office. They've been in touch with me. And um, the American Diabetes Association says that they've had a good working relationship with Governor Gianforte on the issue of diabetes and insulin. And I can tag on to that real quick. You know, for me in my legislation, I plan to have conversations with uh, my colleagues and folks all across the state. You know, I, I really want to take the time to reach out to all the stakeholders and hopefully put together a bill that really gains momentum and builds trust between patients and providers. Um, I've shown in my, my work in the legislature over the last two terms and passing nine bills that I'm able and capable of doing that. Um, and for my part, uh, I know that Democrats are committed to jobs, we're committed to health care, and the way those two intersect is a healthy workforce pushes a healthy economy. And the help link was a key piece of Medicaid expansion in the beginning and continues to be. And as I said, it was a bipartisan. I sponsored the first bill, co-sponsored with Senator Ed Buttry and others. It was a bipartisan bill, continues to be a bipartisan effort. Cool. Um, and then I think we had Jackie, then Daryl, then Zach. I had the same question of Iris as Iris, so I'll just change real quick to clar clarify some language uh, about the diabetes bill. So just to make sure I'm right, that caps all costs of insulin at $35 a month. Jackie. No matter no matter how much you buy, correct? Or need? Per month. No matter okay. how much per month. Yes. Great. Thank you. Cool. Uh, Daryl, then Zach. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Daryl Ehrlich with The Daily Montanan. I have a couple of questions, but I'll yield and come back in line in Q2. Um, 
Uh, my question is for uh, Senator Morjo, um, kind of a two-part question. First of all, doesn't uh, if if uh, healthcare centers have to provide a list of services, is that adding to the bureaucracy and the cost uh, on already thin margins that they have to now start preparing that statement for every one of their patients? And then secondly, um, a lot of the reporting that it has been done on being surprised and shocked by medical care has not been for elective surgeries because people can talk to their health insurance. It's usually on emergency services. Someone had a heart attack, they didn't have a choice of where they went and then they got a, a, a shocking bill. So does this really do help the transparency? Good questions. The first question is, is that this is specifically not um, for emergency services uh, because because of those factors that you just mentioned. Um, you know, we want people to be able to get the care when they're, you know, having a heart attack or whatever that might be. Um, what I'm more spe specifically focused on is non-emergency um, services. You know, this is pre-insurance. So I'm not asking companies to, you know, tell each and every single person to, you know, sift through their, their individual um, insurance program and, and tell them what they're gonna be in their pain. Although, that is one of the biggest frustrations that I continue to hear um, is folks not knowing what their costs are gonna be when they get that bill. But what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to sh show folks, here's what your costs are when you walk in. I want you to see a list of costs. I would argue that um, they already know what those costs are. And um, they already they already charge folks for those particular services and the, the equipment and everything that's um, being tagged onto their bill. Um, I'd argue that this is gonna result in lower costs um, you know, I know that's one of the arguments of the, the bureaucracy of having to provide that information, but um, I think the net result is, is lower cost because people are going to be more informed about their purchase decisions. I think that's going to result in um, avoiding unnecessary hospital costs. And for me, that means less money paid out by insurance companies for each patient, resulting in lower premiums over time. Um, just a real quick follow-up on that for clarification. Is it your position that most uh, most patients are shocked by the bills for elective surgery or non-elective? Um, I would say it's a mix. I, I would say that, you know, uh, I, I when I was uh, campaigning over the summer, I mean, I literally got yelled at about um, the prices that people ended up paying. And and you know, really, a lot of the frustration was people were just like, I, I went in, I thought this would be, you know, an affordable uh, process, and then I got this bill, um, and I didn't, I didn't know that I was going to be on the hook for this. And of course, I know the medical system is complicated when you have all these different players. Um, you know, I'm trying to focus in one niche area of just giving people the basic uh, information when they walk in. It's like going into the store and seeing what the prices are on the items you're purchasing. You know, um, I just want them to be be able to have some informed uh, information to be informed for their decision making process. Um, cool, uh, Zach, then Eric, then Marisa. Just just a uh, question for all three of you, and thank you for your time this afternoon. I'm wondering what kind of feedback you've gotten as far as uh, support across the aisle for for the bills that you're proposing and just in general how you guys um, how all three of you feel the session is going so far um just generally and just what your thoughts are on both those topics thanks um i'll take it like i said before i've reached out to some of my colleagues um and they've expressed their concerns, but um, I'm also working with the Affordable Insulin Coalition of Montana. They operate through a diabetes patients through the hospitals. And those folks have also been talking to my colleagues across the aisle. Um, I'm also working with the American Diabetes Association and their representative um, has had a good working relationship with Governor Gianforte. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful that it will have good support from the other side of the aisle. And this is Shane, I, you know, I've heard from Republicans and Democrats frustration when it comes to, you know, transparency and, and healthcare costs. And this is nothing new. You know, we've, we've seen many efforts over many years of trying to figure out what 
you know, how these, these algorithms are, you know, created and how each person is priced. And so I'm just trying to really do my, my best to try and find a way to um, give people a little more trust in, in our healthcare system to, to provide a little more transparency. Um, and I think that, that creates better competition. I think it creates more trust in our healthcare system. And, um, you know, I haven't, uh, vetted this bill through any particular Republican as of yet, but I do plan to pull all the stakeholders to the table and see how we can work together to um, do what's right for Montana's. And then I'll, as far as the, how the session is going, for me, it, it's fine. I mean, I'm very grateful to be here. Many of my colleagues are not. I'm grateful to be healthy. Uh, in our office, we have fabulous staff. We have fabulous leadership. I'm working with a great group of colleagues all around. And so the session for me personally is going well. The issue is a billion dollars cut in health and human services. And to clarify, when we talk about, is it a cut or is it just the starting point motion? So I'll tell you, this is how I think of it. If my boss came to me and said today, you are gonna get a 5% raise. However, it won't be based on the wage you earned today. It'll be based on the wage you earned in the past, five, six years ago. Is that not a cut? And so the real issue is how is the session going for Montanans, especially children who have disabilities, um, loved ones who suffer from Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, people who work and have disabilities and are counting on that worker to show up and help them get out of bed, get a bath and get to work. For those folks, Montanans, thousands and thousands of Montanans and the people who care for them and are, will lose jobs under this, it's kind of a bad session. As a matter of fact, it's a very bad session. So we're gonna work hard. You know, if Republicans are willing to work with us, you bet, to try to fix that awful billion dollar cut. Um, Eric and then Marita. Yeah. So another question for Senator Morjo about um, have you are there models that are similar to what you're trying to do in other states that where people have tried to do something similar? And also, wasn't there some sort of push for a hospital pricing transparency into the by the Trump administration? Does that square with this? What you're looking at at all? Yeah. So those are good questions, Eric. And and I think there have been states that have done some different variations of, of this particular process, you know, providing, you know, I know um, Massachusetts has done something. I know that there's been other states out of uh, New Mexico. I think there's even a, a website on the initiatives for price transparency um, across different states. And I can get that to you uh, later on. But, um, you know, some of those models are, you know, they're all kind of different in many ways because, you know, for example, Massachusetts has a tool that they use where it's like you could plug it in um, and then look at your insurance plan. I'm not trying to get down into like creating new programs or, or new, um, you know, processes. I just I just want people to be able to have um, the costs up front before they elect to, to proceed with something. Um, and I want that to be required to be provided um, you know, not just when they remember to, to ask for it. Um, and so that's what it really boils down to me is just people being more informed, getting a little more transparency. Um, you know, I know the Trump administration has uh, focused on similar aspects, but that has also included many different um, uh, attributes to what that package looked like, those policies um, that they instituted. Um, and I don't want to go into all of the nuances of that because I'd probably take up uh, our time to to through the lunch hour. But um, yeah, the, the Trump administration has looked at different modes to, to where they want the insurance companies to provide more transparency when it comes to your costs. What I'm specifically looking at is um, the, the the care provider to provide that list of costs um, for folks to be more informed. Sorry, to, I don't want to belabor this point too much, but um, how how would your bill intersect with insurance companies? Because it, it is is the number is the cost before insurance a meaningful number for people to get, knowing that sometimes but not always the much or all the cost is picked up by insurance. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it is meaningful. You know, when 
uh, you know, you know what your deductible is or what your plan might be. Um, you know, if there's a co-payer or whatever your plan, particular plan that you purchased is. Um, and so I think it's important for people to see what those initial costs look like um, in regardless of whether or not that, that bill um, ends up being less based on, you know, the negotiated prices between the, the, the insurance companies and the medical providers. But I, yeah, I just think that it, it's, I still just believe that it institutes some transparency in our healthcare system. It makes people feel more comfortable about the, the care they're getting. Um, and, it, and it instills a little more trust in, in these processes. Cool. Uh, we'll go Marita, then Daryl. All right, this is also for Senator Morjo. Um, thank you again. I'm wondering, I have two questions. Um, in the name of transparency on this, would it include being clear about markups? I mean, I know speaking anecdotally for myself, I had a back surgery this year and my hardware markup was more than four times. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, that's, what, that's what I'm really looking for is, you know, for people when they go in, and they're sitting down to get that surgery, they can see that cost right out the gate, you know? And um, and I think people deserve to have that transparency, whether, you know, um, init the initial cost of what that's gonna cost them, they, they, they deserve to see that. So um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. So is there any specific language about like being clear about how much that service might be marking up, say hardware or actual products being used? Yeah, so I, I don't have any specific uh, language uh, yet on on markups, but you know my my thought process is essentially you get a list of costs like a you know like a menu or like you go into the store and you can see your prices, and so um, that would be the expectation is that's the starting point. That's where they're starting from for for your particular costs, and I think this I think this does put a little pressure on those hospitals to be more consistent on their prices. Um, and what they're um, ultimately um, going to be negotiating and how they negotiate that with the insurance company and that particular patient. Um, you know, I'm not asking them to tell me each and every single patient's because I do understand that that would be pretty uh, cumbersome and nuanced for them. But what I am asking for is that they be upfront about what those costs are going to be for you um, when you step into that room and they give those costs to you, um, you know, on a piece of paper. And then building on that, do you expect any backlash from, say, the hospital association or um, anybody in that field? You know, I, I, I would expect that, you know, there was a question asked earlier about, um, you know, the, the adding more additional burden on, on folks. And, and I understand that they, they have a lot on their plates or doing a lot of work. Um, I would like to, to talk to them. Uh, you know, when I had meetings um, early on with hospitals, they actually said, yeah, we know there's places where we can we can always do better. Um, and that's where I wanna find, you know, if, if we have to identify a place where we can take baby steps to start getting people more transparency, I think that's a win-win because we're getting people that trust, that transparency that they, they are demanding. Um, it also makes the hospitals look better. And I think it, it has an end net result of um, just being a win-win for everybody. So, um, you know, I would expect that there, they're, you know, if we can identify some places to start, I think that would be the ideal. Um, and that's where I would like to start having the conversations because you know, if it's just a blanket for everything, there might be some, you know, some pushback on that front, but that's where I'd like to ultimately get. Well, um, and let's go to Daryl and then we'll, we'll probably wanna wrap as we get to the half hour mark here. But Daryl, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Representative Karjala, possible follow-up to on insulin prices. How did you decide $35 when you, the example you gave was 2,100? How did we how did we arrive at that that at that number? Thanks, Daryl. I, I think the $2,100 is an extreme example. I think um, if I was going to ballpark it, uh, most diabetes patients are paying anywhere between three to four hundred dollars a month for their insulin out of pocket. Um, this is a bill, like I said before, that's passed in several other states. They've set their caps at varying rates where you don't want to start out at the highest possible out-of-pocket cost. You want to start out at a negotiating rate. So um, I anticipate that perhaps being negotiated. So we wanted to start out at a good negotiating point. 
So there's no, uh, on 35, there's no magical number. There's not an average or anything. This is just a starting point. Yes, the, the $35, I would consider a starting point. I will negotiate on that. Um, I, I would prefer that it stay at $35, but, um, it, you know, it's been as high as 125 in other states, I believe. So um, hopefully it won't go any higher than that. Are you worried that drug companies will not participate at that rate? Well, I don't think that it will be the drug companies that will be impacted. I think that it, if it has an impact on anyone, it will be private insurers. And from the testimony from bill hearings in other states, that impact has been what they've called de minimis. It hasn't had that big of an impact on pools due to the larger pools. All right, well, um, really appreciate everyone jumping on and, and thanks for, for all the questions and, and lively discussion here. Um, if folks have, have additional follow-ups, feel, feel free to um, send them along to, to myself or Aaron. Um, but yeah, with that, just wanna thank everyone for their time and, and we'll let folks get back to their Wednesday. Thank you. We're doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan.